Nowadays, schematics for retro computers are readily available online. You might have downloaded yours, taken a look at it, and wondered what the heck is going on. There's all these components and wires, and they're all connected in what seem to be random ways. I'm going to start by saying I'm not an electrical engineer, which you can tell by my choice of screwdriver, which has a nice center conductor ready to electrocute me pretty much at any time. But I do develop software for a living, and programming is really all about pattern recognition. Even with modern tools, the ability to spot that one out-of-place character is a huge advantage, and it's something you build up over time. Being forced to practice this every day because of my work, I found that I was able to apply pattern recognition to looking at schematics. And once I could find those patterns, I could more easily determine you know, what that subcomponent of the circuit actually did. So today I'm going to share with you my top 10 list of patterns that I find in retro computer schematics. If you're an accomplished engineer or a hardcore hobbyist, you probably know all this stuff, so you might not find this video to be too interesting. However, if you're just getting started in hardware hacking, maybe uh, what I've been able to learn will help you out a bit. Let's start with the simplest one, the bypass capacitor. I've intentionally kept this topic at a high level because there's a lot of other videos that explain this in great detail on YouTube already. Now the bypass capacitor is seen all over the place in retro computers. Basically next door to any chip on the board, you're gonna find one of these capacitors. There's a big change in current flow when a digital device turns off and on. The current drain of the device itself increases greatly and all of the dependent devices connected to that, they also increase in current. The bypass capacitor serves as a short-term energy store to provide power to these rapidly changing loads. Take a look at this motherboard. It's full of bypass capacitors. Basically, there's a capacitor next to every chip. A resistor tied to a digital line and either the negative or the positive rail is a pattern that you'll see all over the place in retro computers. This resolves a specific issue in a digital logic circuit. The problem is the absence of a specific signal on a line doesn't necessarily mean low. It actually means it's undefined. When a line is left floating, induced currents from other lines, stray voltages from components on the board, as well as RF energy, you know, from the local golden oldies radio station can cause digital lines to float back and forth between high and low, and this causes false signaling. For that reason, many digital lines are pulled in one direction or another. On the Radio Shack Color Computer 3, right next to the CPU, you can see that the halt, non-maskable interrupt, interrupt request, and fast interrupt request lines are all tied to plus five volts. The pull-up resistors connected to each of these lines prevent any of them from falsely being triggered. Voltage dividers are one of my favorite patterns to spot. Basically, any pair of resistors between the positive source and ground is a voltage divider. The point where the two resistors connect will present a voltage that is related to the ratio between the values of those two resistors. Voltage dividers can be used to ensure voltage input values are within an appropriate range. They can be used to bias transistor inputs, and they can also be used to build simple digital to analog converters. The COCO-1 digital to analog converter is pretty cool. There's a PIA chip which has six outputs, and they go into this MC-14 0508 and those outputs run through a resistor here which when combined with this resistor here that makes a voltage divider so you can see two resistors and there's something in the middle there there's a point we're pulling a voltage from here's our plus five volts and then what happens is is that if the output is off then this is actually zero volts so this forms a voltage divider. And then you'll get a voltage at this point that is based on the ratio between these two resistors. Where it gets interesting is that you can take these outputs in any combination you like. What that means is, is that you'll be able to switch on different circuits based on what line is low. So we could turn these three on here and you have three different voltage dividers 
and that will contribute to the overall voltage that goes into this chip here. Having this flexibility, you can actually generate, you've got six bits in here, so you can generate 64 different voltages, which means you can basically do ramps like this and do ramps down like that. Essentially, that allows you to make sine waves. And once you can do sine waves, you can make sound. Most retro computers have an integrated video circuit that allows the computer to connect directly to a display. Generally speaking, the signals created by the chips on the circuit board aren't strong enough to drive an external monitor just by themselves. So an amplifier of some sort is required. Often, instead of using an amplifier chip, a simple transistor amplifier will be used instead. The Radio Shack Color Computer 3 RGB outputs are a good example of a simple transistor amplifier. The RGB output of the COCO is generated by the GIMI chip and it comes out of these three pins here. Each of these pins lead to a separate amplifier. So you can see there's transistors here and each one, each little grouping is a separate amplifier. So we've got one amplifier here, got one below, etc, etc. There's a very small current coming out of the GIMI chip which goes into the base of the transistor here, which in turn controls a larger current coming out of this five volt rail. And then that goes to the RGB output. If you're really paying attention, you might've noticed that here we have a positive voltage, here we have ground, and we've got two resistors here and here. What that means is this point is the output of a voltage divider. And that voltage divider output is used to bias the input to this transistor. Retro computers interface with a number of analog devices. Floppy disks are essentially an analog medium. Cassette tapes are, video output, sound input and output. These are all analog. When you're working with analog signals, you often need to filter those signals before they're processed. And one of those filters is quite often an LC filter, which is a filter made from a capacitor and an inductor. This is the schematic for the Commodore 64, and it has a good example of an LC filter. On the Commodore 64, you've got your VIC chip, which is a really important chip on the board. It has an output which is synchronization and luminosity. Now this signal goes through here and it basically goes through what appears to be a transistor amp. And the luminosity signal comes out this line on pin one. The composite video signal goes down this path here into the dead giveaway for an LC filter, which is your inductor there. And then right next door we have a capacitor. So the inductor is your L and the capacitor is your C. In conjunction with this resistor here, these two components form roughly a 6.2 megahertz low pass filter. And that signal that has been filtered goes into the composite video input. If we look at the signal starting at zero hertz and say this is five megahertz and this is 10 megahertz, what's gonna happen is that all of the signal here is gonna be allowed in and then it's gonna start to drop at six and then go down to pretty much nothing at these high frequencies. A current shunt works off a simple principle. If you measure the voltage on either side of a resistor with a known value, you could determine the current flowing through that resistor because you can see the voltage drop. If you use a small enough resistor, the voltage drop won't be enough to impact the operation of the circuit, but you'll still be able to see a voltage drop and thereby calculate the current flowing through that resistor. To make things even easier, you can use a one ohm resistor and that will allow you to eliminate one of the variables in Ohm's law so that the current drawn in amps is equal to the voltage drop across the resistor. Makes it really simple. You might go through a complicated process of measuring the voltage drop and then performing some action based upon it. Or you could do something simple like in this mini disk drive where the voltage drop is used as feedback into a transistor switching circuit that controls the motor speed and this is actually used to prevent the motor from overloading if something's jammed in the uh, drive itself. There are times when you need to invert the value of a digital line and instead of using a chip for this, you can just use a simple transistor. 
Depending on what connection on the transistor is used as the signal line, the transistor can be thought of as either a inverting or non-inverting switch. The Commodore 64 has a great example of a transistor NOT gate. The cassette motor output here is actually inverted, so if you have a digital 1 here, you will get a 0 output on the cassette motor plug. And the way it does that is that if there is no voltage here on this line, the 9 volts from this source travels through to the base of this transistor, which activates the transistor, causing current to flow to the base of this transistor, which then in turn activates it, allowing current to flow through into this cassette motor. So essentially you get a positive voltage on that side. When there is a high state on this cassette motor output, what happens is current flows through this line into the base of this transistor, activating it. This provides a low impedance path to ground, and that causes this line here to not have enough current to activate this transistor. So this one is not active. So the 9 volts can't travel through this transistor, which in turn causes this transistor not to activate, meaning the 9 volts cannot travel through it either. And then you get a 0 volt output on this cassette motor out. Another thing you'll see a lot are simple generic logic chips on the board and these are used for functions that pretty much every retro computer has a need for. A buffer takes whatever you input to it and outputs the exact same signal. So what use is it? By adding an additional buffer, the fan out capabilities or the capability of a chip to drive other chips for say a microprocessor can be greatly enhanced. Another use, although not as common, is to protect an expensive chip from damage. By buffering all the lines in and out of an expensive chip like a CPU, those cheap generic buffer chips can be used essentially as sacrificial chips to protect it in case you know something is plugged in wrong into the computer. The Radio Shack Color Computer 3 CPU has a good example of a buffer in use. All of the data lines on the CPU here are all buffered through this 74LS245 chip. Now this is technically a tri-state buffer, but pin 19 is grounded out, so it is never tri-stated. The direction of the data flow is controlled by pin 1, this direction pin, which is tied directly to the read-write pin on the CPU. This is basically a two-way buffer, allowing the CPU to write out to the data bus and receive data back while still being isolated from it. A tri-state buffer performs essentially the same function as a regular buffer. But instead of having two states on and off, it has a third high impedance state that is essentially equivalent to it being disconnected from the circuit. This allows a single digital line to be controlled by multiple chips. Modern microcontrollers like the AVRs are able to go into a tri-state mode right out of the box. Older microprocessors didn't always have this function, so you'll often see tri-state buffers connected to microprocessors and interfacing them with either the data bus or the address bus. The Apple II is a great example of tri-state buffers being used on the CPU. On the CPU, we have our address bus, these lines here, and these lines here. They are connected into an LS244, so there we've got one there and we've got one there all connected onto the bus via the LS244. Connected on the LS244, we have the output enables, both of them, and we have them connected to the DMA line. This allows a DMA enabled device to essentially remove the 6502 entirely from the circuit and directly send data to the MMU and therefore directly put data in memory. It's actually a really great feature that most home computers at the time didn't have. A typical latch in a retro computer works as a single byte storage device. A latch is often used when interfacing subsystems where an intermediate state needs to be maintained by one system while the partner system needs to move on to additional work. The Color Computer 2 video display generator uses an LS273 latch because it shares the clock cycle with the CPU. The VGG, well actually the SAM, puts the location of the next character block 
in the latch so that the CPU can move on and change the address on the address bus, but the video display generator still has the location uh, where it was last looking for data. Well, there you have my top 10 list of patterns in retro computer circuits. If you have a pattern that I should have mentioned or that you see all the time, please put it in the comments below. It'd be great to hear what other people see when they're working on their computers. If you like this video and you like this kind of content, please consider subscribing. I need all the subs I can get right now and I really appreciate every one of my subscribers. Thanks for watching and I hope you have fun with your retro computers and other old technology.